we have a, a, a great crowd assembled here of students and um, people from the, from the community. Uh, my name is Uva Brandis. I'm executive director of the Urban and Regional Planning Program here at, at Georgetown. And uh, we are halfway through our spring speaker series, our inaugural uh, speaker series celebrating the creation of the program. Uh, we had a fall speaker series that was focused primarily on Washington, D.C. and the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. And this spring, uh, we are focusing on a variety of professional issues associated with urban uh, planning and urban redevelopment. Um, and uh, we are delighted uh, today to have Gordon Feller with us. <clears throat> uh, Gordon is joining us virtually uh, from Silicon Valley. Um, and I'm going to do a formal introduction of Gordon and then hand it over to, to him uh, and to his presentation. And I look forward to uh, really a very uh, uh, dynamic conversation today um, with Gordon. Gordon is director of the Urban Innovations Team at Cisco. He works with city leaders worldwide in both public and private sectors. In this capacity, he supports Cisco's numerous China initiatives, while simultaneously leading uh, the new city leader program for China mayors and city-based uh, party secretaries. Prior to joining Cisco, uh, Gordon was the CEO of the Urban Age Institute, which fosters leadership and innovation among cities in the areas of strategic urban planning, policy, management, and sustainable environmental planning, as well as poverty reduction. For nearly 30 years, he has advised leaders of multinational companies, cities, NGOs, foundations, national governments, on issues related to urban development. <clears throat> uh, Gordon advises leaders on how information and communications technology can help solve complex urban environmental issues, while also developing practical and forward-looking solutions at the intersection of economics, technology, and urban sustainability. Uh, he has a bachelor's in political science and a master's in international affairs from Columbia University. And I'd like to uh, say a few things uh, now. <clears throat> First of all, thank you very much, Gordon, for uh, spending time with us this afternoon. Uh, Gordon was recently here uh, with us um, in his capacity as one of the advisors to, to the program. And uh, so he's been here and visited us. He knows the space. Uh, we've walked it with him. Um, but it is entirely appropriate that we uh, have this session today with Gordon in a virtual manner, uh, because I think he's really going to be uh, addressing how cities and information networks are changing so rapidly uh, with respect to the digital revolution that we are all, all a part of. Uh, I've asked Gordon to prepare and present uh, a short PowerPoint presentation, and, um, and then I look forward to all of us engaging Gordon in, in, a, in a dialogue around information, urban development, and the role of community development in, in this new, new era of, of digitally connected cities. So with that, Gordon, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thanks. Thanks so much for those kind words, and I appreciate the chance to be with you virtually. I would have loved to have been in uh, my, one of my favorite airports, Dulles, but of course, uh, you can't get everything you want in life. But I figured this is a second best opportunity. So uh, you see the title there, which is almost the definition of cities. We, we won't try to debate what the definition of a city is, but when Uwe suggested this title, it was, uh, you know, perhaps close to what cities are becoming, if nothing else. Um, I'm here in an airport today, so you'll have to excuse some of the background noise, but I'm glad to be able to join you. And I'm going to zip through this and save as much time as possible for the Q&A. I hope, uh, let's see, the time I have right now is 5.34 your time. So maybe I'll plan to wind this down five minutes after 6 to leave us with enough time for the discussion. So zipping through, here's, um, here's a uh, natural capital perspective on what we see as the different dimensions of the challenge 
that we're trying to address, particularly inside cities. And you can see uh, we're we're looking not just at the community level and the neighborhood level up at the top left, but we're we're trying to get very concrete. So government agencies, healthcare providers, educational institutions, and other public service entities, we want to be able to meet their needs. And we have customers in all of these areas that you see who are trying to find the greenest and smartest solutions that they can deploy in their cities. And I'm going to go into some of the details. Uh, it wouldn't be a Silicon Valley presentation with a lot of fancy, without a lot of fancy graphics and without some uh, eye-popping eye charts. I won't expect you to memorize any of these things for the quiz later uh, because the quiz is a written exam. But I will you know, offer this slideshow to you as a, uh, a takeaway and hopefully you'll get from the uh, Urban and Regional Program, you'll get a copy of this if you want it. And I'm always available to answer questions afterwards. So let's get right into the nitty gritty detail, starting at the community level, which is where we always like to begin because that's where people live and work and play and learn. Um, so we look at drivers because we think that we have to start at a fundamental level we call them business drivers because it's the business of the city. Uh, and every city, of course, starts with the development challenge. That is, how do they create the kinds of locations and places and what we call connected destinations that promote economic uh, sustainability, social responsibility, where the quality of life can be very high. Because when city governments are working with us or urban development companies who are members of the Urban Land Institute or any other entity who is working in, in and for the city, uh, we take their needs very seriously. And this, the need that we hear from them all the time is that they want to create places in cities which are not only hyper-connected, uh, but hyper-sustainable. So we look at a lot of different types of segments of the city because, of course, our customers manage and own and operate these places, whether they're retail or commercial, whether it's a municipal government or another type of government office, whether it's an educational facility or a residential or a workplace. And um, we're always looking at the question from the standpoint, again, of the business driver, how do we add value, which shows up in a very tangible way as increasing the value of the property and the return on the investment for the investor or the lender but also the government who's taxing that property. Um, and finally, you know, we are, we're interested in the branding challenge because every city is now becoming very focused on their brand and their differentiator, their strategic differentiation in the competitive marketplace where cities are competing with each other for talent and for capital and for investment. So we have these operational principles there on the wheel. And we start with community, but we realize that what enables uh, a community to happen is the connections between people and we try to facilitate that by providing the technology that enables connectivity um, but we really want that to have an outcome which we think is is what we call the healthy living agenda and that means healthy communities not just physically healthy uh, but emotionally environmentally um, socially uh, culturally we take it we take it in a holistic context which is why we try in that wheel to identify many challenges at the operating level that we want to be able to solve. And the, the building is the connected real estate, as we call it, the CRE. At the building level, we have to work not just with architects, designers, planners, engineers, uh, but the building owners and the building managers and ultimately the tenant who wants to know that something different is delivered to them other than an extra premium on the price for a green building. So this is one of those eye charts, um, and you know it, it goes back to what we do. We're an infrastructure company, so we have found what we call foundation technologies, the fundamentals like fiber to the home or fiber to the workplace. That's what FTTX means on the top left. Uh, obviously, you have, you have to have voice communications. That's a foundation. You have to have uh, IP-enabled television, uh, digital television. All of the others that you see there, and I won't I won't uh, bore you with all those details now. We can come back to any of these. And then on the, on the right column, you see the services that we think are going to be most relevant. And in every city, of course, and with every urban development project, the mix 
of foundation technologies and service technologies is going to vary. So yesterday I met with a developer who's redeveloping a site in Toronto, a multi-billion dollar investment, the largest urban development project in North America when it gets started, um, bigger than any of the others that you've read about, for instance, Hudson Yards in Manhattan. And they're going to probably have all of these things because they're going to have tens of thousands of people at their location every day. And they need to know that they can provide not only physical security and digital security uh, and a healthy environment that's constantly monitored for air flows and air quality uh, or sound and the, aud the audible range of noise, but a lot of other things that not only are monitored, but, and this is the critical piece to, to keep in mind, we not only want to enable the monitoring of what's happening, but also the management, which means changing when you see something in the monitoring system that tells you a door is open, which shouldn't be open, or a certain kind of air quality you're showing up, which is not a healthy air quality, uh, then you want to change that. So monitoring is never enough. It's really the, the, the change management and facilitating that remotely so that wherever I am, if I'm responsible for monitoring air quality, I might be in a different city or in a different building or a different country, I can remotely as part of my work, not just monitor, but also change the situation and improve air quality or improve security or any of the other fundamentals that I've decided I want to invest in. So let me skip ahead, not bore you with too many of these details and really talk about what we think are uh, the bottom line ingredients, the, the absolute musts, the must haves rather than the nice to haves. Um, and we think in any urban development, whether it's a small microcosmic scale, a particular house or apartment building or on a macro scale for the city as a whole, you can see on the left-hand side uh, what we think of as the five key ingredients. We want to provide new ways to reach people to learn. Uh, we want to enhance access to healthcare. We want to enable um, the, all the infrastructure. Um, like water, like gas, like electric, like transportation, those four being the most expensive uh, to reach their maximum potential, which we think is to make them efficient and sustainable. Um, we want to help power the neighborhood services. And I don't just mean utility services, although that's what I typed there. I mean broadly all the services, whether it's police and fire and law enforcement or any of the other services. And finally, uh, this was a slide that we created for Lakeside a large development of about 500 acres in Chicago, uh, we wanted to connect the community which is attached to this development, which is not very uh, economically prosperous. In fact, it's very disadvantaged uh, in the southeastern portion of the, of the lakeside there in South Lake of uh, uh, Lake Michigan in Chicago. We want to connect that community to advanced information technologies. And that's what we think is fundamental to achieving all of the four things that you see above. Um, so we take Lakeside as an example because it's, you know, it's one of the largest property redevelopment projects in the United States. It's a brownfield site, um, which we can talk more about as an example of what we're doing in providing the master ICT plan and in now helping to implement that plan even before any ground is broken. Um, and we want that community to feature and to embody what we think is an advanced integrated information and communications technology network. Um, because we think that people want to live in these places, because we think that it's competitive for them uh, as employers to compete for talent, and that's something that we hear a lot, not just from the city authorities, but from the corporates who are making the investments, whether it's the banks, and the insurers who are putting their capital on the line or the property developers. Their tenants are increasingly saying to them, they want these kinds of things that we, we list there, um, including that sort of entrepreneurial culture, entrepreneurial environment, which has to have critical ingredients like energy efficient buildings, like clean energy supplied to those buildings, like uh, mobility, um, particularly urban mobility in multiple modes and not just passenger vehicle mode. So we come back to the 
what we think of as the key ingredients in the smart community, uh, which is the buildings. And I won't bore you with the details of this particular chart, but I'll just use it to say, you know, we we see the legacy systems uh, as being essentially a barrier to getting to the next stage of development. In the legacy system, you know, the typical architecture for what, what are essentially not converged systems is that all the systems are connected to individual cabling and they're unconnected at the user level. So each system needs its own specialist and often the data is proprietary to a particular manufacturer um, and they're tying you to them, that is you the user to a particular manufacturer for the life of the building. This is single sourcing and it's not a very good way to do anything. Uh, no single user interface for the building, no easy way to access and analyze all the, you know, the information flowing in the building. Uh, this not only wastes a vast amount of natural resources like the copper that flows in the building or the fiber, uh, but it's also more expensive to install and maintain it. And it's very difficult to upgrade when the technology changes, not often does change. So, you know, the fundamental ingredient here is there's no interoperability between the silo. Um, solution applications. Now let's move what we think is a better way to do this, which is a converged network. Um, and the architecture allows all systems to be connected to a common infrastructure. That means all the energy systems in the building, all the security systems in the building, all the facility management systems, all the maintenance systems, and of course the IT network. Um, it saves a lot on the capital expenditures, but it also reduces the life cycle costs which means how you operate those systems. So once the physical layer is addressed, uh, we deploy with our partners something called the middleware. Uh, that normalizes all the protocols, because in a building, not everything in that building is going to be internet protocol enabled. So we want to be able to normalize the protocols between the different building systems and provide a common, a common platform, a common mechanism to exchange all that valuable information. We'll come back to that. So we think internet protocol is now, we know it, is now the global standard. Um, and that's why you're able on your smartphone to communicate with anybody's video that's been sent to you or have any kind of video conference or any of the other advanced features of a smartphone are because it's all on the internet protocol. Um, we think inside a building power over, over the cable, over the ethernet is going to change a lot of the features of the electric, electrical engineering in the building. We want to transform how the building actually performs. And as I said earlier, we want to monitor and measure and ultimately control what I called before manage. Um, and we want to be able, and this is the ideal for everybody in the building, whether it's the manager of the building or the tenant or anybody else, we want to be able to, in, to respond in real time and change the situation to optimize the circumstance, whether it's we've discovered a security problem or we've discovered an air quality problem or we've discovered an energy and efficiency challenge, we want to be able to respond in real time. And the goal is to be sustainable as a building. So we look at buildings, you know, really in multiple levels. There are information services inside, running through, running around, running outside in all various layers of the building, but we have fundamental services that people expect. They expect their building to be lit. They want their elevators to work. They want to be tracking things like carts and equipment. They want sensors to know when the HVAC system is not working. They want to know when there's a fire. They want to have video surveillance for security. They want access control in the buildings. And they ultimately want energy at a reasonable cost, highly efficient. So our job we see is to, you know, take these technologies to harness the power of internet protocol, digital technology, to get the energy savings, to get the operational efficiency, and to utilize innovative technology to make the building smart and green and clean. So we see our mission to be using the tools that are now abundantly available on a ma macro scale rather than simply on the micro level with individual users, with an individual own interface. We want to have that same operating system be relevant for the city as a whole. And we're working to build those. And we'd like to say that it will know it when it's 
happening because we can be connected anywhere, anytime, on any system to the city's basic metabolic processes. So we think the place where you have to begin from a citizen standpoint is in the home. And these are the emerging customer demands on the left, which are gradually becoming available through applications. Obviously, when Google bought Nest uh, for $3.5 billion, they wanted not just the energy management at the thermostat in the smart home, but they wanted to be able to extend it, as you will see Google does, into home security and a lot of other features. Um, and they are also, of course, going to have the effect of disrupting the traditional residential construction model uh, because, you know, as communities develop and grow, and they struggle with a lot of different types of complex and conflicting priorities, uh, such as safety and security or the efficient delivery of services, um, we think that the fundamental ingredient is going to be that different properties will have different areas of focus, but the smart and connected home, the smart home, is going to be a platform that allows a variety of services and applications to be integrated. And we're working with a lot of the developers who are building these kinds of homes. Um, and they see this as a business that has a lot of opportunity. Um, it was only $5.3 billion worldwide in 2010, but you can see the jump in 2015. I think that $11 billion actually is a, a fairly modest number compared to what we're seeing, which is tremendous growth in this area. I heard yesterday from one of the primary um, telcos in Dubai, and they're launching a whole new business focused on the smart home and using their telecom services as the enabler to enable new services delivered into the home. So you can see here on this chart the kinds of smart home capabilities. They're not that dissimilar from the smart connected building, commercial building, or retail facility, or even manufacturing facility. Uh, but there are different applications that are relevant. Um, lots of people want to be able to have the lifestyle at the bottom as a fundamental feature. This is not a nice to have. For many people who can afford it, it's a must have. And this is becoming increasingly popular, and perhaps that's another reason why Google bought Nest. Uh, but we think at every level, the technology is available now. This is not rocket science. Uh, this is not futuristic. This is currently available. The question is how to integrate these things so you don't have 25 competing systems, each with unique uh, unique applications that need to be run separately. How do you integrate this to make it seamless and easy for the end user, the home resident, to be able to access these services and monitor, whether it's monitoring their refrigerator and turning it down because they're going to be away for more than six hours and they know that they can reduce their energy budget by remotely reducing the total energy consumption and doing that remotely. And managing that and monitoring that remotely. So we're now, uh, this is a picture of a, of a, a complex that we've helped design and build in Songdo in South Korea, a multi-billion dollar complex of residential, commercial, government, uh, retail, education, healthcare facilities. Uh, like we say, live, work, play, and learn all in the same space. Um, this is a very internet enabled apartment uh, there are tens of thousands of residents in Songdo now, so we'll get a you know a pretty good reading from their usage pattern because the building owner and operator and manager uh, can track the use of these if if the resident decides that they want to make that kind of access to data available. Some people think it's spooky and that they don't want to have the doc, the the, uh, the uh, uh, big brother big brotherish intrusion even if it's reading anonymized data. Some people prefer to have their anonymized data not accessible to anybody anywhere, anytime. And so this is all permission-based, and you have to opt in. But the idea is to know how well certain features are being utilized and how often so that we can constantly improve not just the quality of service, but the types of services that are available in different categories. So you can see here many different types of, of solutions that we've deployed. Um, to automate the lights so that remotely on my mobile app panel there on the bottom left or the touch panel uh, or on my smartphone, I can change the lighting in the room 
while I'm there or remotely, I can change the HVAC. I can manage my energy, for instance, uh, just by manipulating the blinds. So these are some of the features that have now been integrated into the most advanced smart buildings within what we think are emerging smart cities. Um, and of course, we want to be able to have new revenue opportunities for the building owner and the building manager. Um, we want to be able to have new types of security to take advantage of this. We want to connect people in new ways on the big screens and the small screens. Um, and we want to be able to have people access remotely whoever and wherever and whenever we're on somebody else's screen. I'd like to talk to my nurse. I'm not feeling so well. I'd like to talk to my, my child's teacher. Uh, I don't really understand what this homework is all about. And so you can imagine the possibilities. So we think the smart building is critical. The smart home is critical. Uh, we start with the smart community and, and we end with the smart work center. And we think that smart work centers are going to be a particularly revolutionary way for the story to change. I just do a time check here. Okay, I've got eight more minutes. So we've, we've helped a variety of partners of ours develop what we think are the third solution, neither work nor home, uh, but a smart work center. And we think that the smart work center offers a solution that could become a pretty significant way of not only reducing the need to commute, because none of us should have to commute in order to compute, uh, but we want to be able to reduce the number of vehicle miles traveled in cities that are congested, improving the work-life balance, maybe saving a couple of marriages in the process, uh, but also improving the, the use of people's time and their productivity and creating new ways to work and collaborate. And so uh, these are some of the components, the technology components you see in a smart work center on the left and the social components, um, which means that you can situate these smart work centers, these third Third locations in people's lives in any number of lo in any number of localities, including uh, right where people already live. That's one of the advantages to having these these types of, uh, of digitally intelligent workspaces. Um, and we're now doing this in 150 locations in the Netherlands. And you can see some of the benefits that have been identified uh, by the Dutch. These are just uh, some inputs that we got from the Dutch recently when they are looking at who, who benefits and how. And uh, we think that you know, these, are, these are the kinds of options that now are possible with a hyper-connected digital infrastructure that allows a smart workspace to emerge. So these are some of the features in a smart workspace, including a, a concierge who's sitting in some central location that might be servicing 25 of these locations around the world. Uh, that's how we do it at Cisco, by the way, is all of our receptionists are remotely located in places where we think it's easier for them to live, which is usually at home. There's no reason a receptionist can't be working from home. So moving quickly through this, let me close with a couple of um, uh, principles that we think have come to pass. And these principles have come to pass because, or, or let's say emerged, because We've seen in a variety of settings in cities that this is something that cuts across. Um, number one, city leaders are very focused on reducing their budgets and increasing the economic opportunity environment for not just entrepreneurs, but everybody. And so we have to be able to provide technologies and services that are going to be relevant to those people. And let me pull up for a moment a slide which helps to identify what that is. Let me see if I can find it here. Um, <laughs> bear with me a second, and I think I'll be able to find it. Maybe not. Well, all right. So I thought I had it. Maybe maybe I will find it here. Bear with me a second. Um, no. Okay. So I was going to show something which hopefully would help to dramatize that point, but we can come back to it 
and I'll send the link to uh, the staff there at the Urban and Regional Program so you can see what I was driving at. But basically, that principle, number one principle, means that city leaders, electeds, appointed, and other types of city leaders who may not even know that they're city leaders who are enabling communities to prosper and neighborhoods to develop in new ways, those people expect practical solutions to real practical problems. And we're trying to develop those solutions in partnership with a big ecosystem of other other companies. So in energy management, that's Schneider Electric, it's Siemens, it's Johnson Controls, it's Honeywell, it's iCharm, just to take examples in the energy and in the energy sector. Um, and it's not just working with utilities, but it's working with the energy systems inside buildings where utilities often never touch. And that's been a focus of us, of us at Cisco, but also a major focus for our partners. Um, so the second principle is that all the stuff in the world is going to be quickly getting connected to all the other stuff in the world. And that's a pretty significant impact because this Internet of Everything, as we call it, means that it's not only just the things that are going to be connected to each other, but then the process changes. And let me take an example. We have a partnership in the transportation and mobility arena a company called Streetline, which is based in, in Silicon Valley, a uh, very, very savvy company that's doing some very interesting work in making the parking space a dynamic environment where information is constantly flowing, uh, using, to begin with, a sensor that's put in the asphalt that talks to the wireless network that allows somebody to know on the fly while they're heading to a location where the parking spot is that's open. But it not only is a thing-to-thing -thing communication, a machine-to-machine -machine communication between the sensor and the wireless access point that then talks to the data center, that then communicates instantly to my application on my phone that tells me exactly where I can park and what the rate is, but it allows the city, which owns the parking space, to dynamically change the price of that parking space or collect the fee for that parking space in an entirely new way and to analyze that data to see when I can incentivize me, the driver, when the city can incentivize me to not park in the central business district, but because of price, because I've had a price presented to me for that parking spot, which is pretty astronomical because the city has made a decision that they want to reduce congestion in the central business district. And I'm going to find one in not at the red zone, but in the yellow zone or even farther away in the green zone and walk or maybe use a, use a bike share or any number of other options that are presented to me while I'm driving, hopefully without distracting me from the road. So these are the kinds of machine-to-machine -machine options that are not just Internet of Things, where things are talking to things, but where the process changes, the process of managing the city transit and transportation systems and we think that's a particularly great opportunity for cities not only to collect more revenue from us people parking, which is what cities really want to do since it's not, not a, 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 a tax, um, at least they don't define it as a tax. Uh, it's a service that they provide in their parking space. But they also want to improve the quality of the shopper and commuter experience. They want to improve the amount of money that's spent in the retail environment. All of those kinds of things, obviously, are benefits. And we think that smart parking is going to be a killer application for the city. Uh, and one primary reason is city sees, cities see the potential for dramatically increased revenue from their expensive parking spaces. Uh, they can utilize those spaces more intelligently, and they can dynamically price if they choose to. So I'll sum up by saying we see a fantastic opportunity for the city as a living laboratory to change the way that not only citizens interact with the city and the services and, and the amenities of the city uh, or where employers can change the experience of their employees in the city or where hotels can change the experience of visitors to the city. Uh, but we think the city as a complete system is likely to change as internet-based internet-powered technologies and the network underneath them are more abundantly available at higher speeds. 
and that kind of broadband, that kind of high-speed solution is something which, which we think will represent a big opportunity for uh, a lot of different actors in the city environment. So maybe with that, since it's exactly five minutes after, uh, maybe I'll I'll close my mouth and open the microphone and floor to questions that are hopefully um, abundant in the room. So I'm all yours for questions. Thank you very, very much. That was a fantastic way to, to kick this off. Um, I'm not sure, are we gonna use the mics or? Yeah. Okay, I, I'll, I'll pick the mic around, but as, as I grab the mic, Gordon, um, can you reflect just one thing that I didn't mention in, in uh, your introduction is um, you, you are not always in Silicon Valley. You, you spend a lot of time on the road. You meet with lots of both industry leaders, but also many, many public officials who are seeking to um, uh, leapfrog their city in, into this future. Uh, could you reflect on who's in a leadership position in this incredible transformation? Is it all of us or are public officials still in the lead in terms of thinking about the future planning of, of their communities? If you could just reflect on leadership and how that's distributed across the public, private, and nonprofit sectors of cities. Sure. So, uh, you know, we see different types of leaders for different types of elements. So one element, of course, is who has the infrastructure that can enable a new solution like Streetline to emerge. So clearly cities own the parking spaces and you can't innovate around parking unless you have access to the actual parking space itself. So we have to start with whoever, and we think this is a critical piece of the puzzle that now is falling into place. We have to get the key infrastructure owners to make access to the infrastructure available for innovative technologies to plug in. And that's what we did. You know, the first city to really become a major adopter of this is a small city in Silicon Valley called San Carlos, which is close to uh, San Francisco Airport. And they deployed this street line uh, sensor-based wireless system in the parking spaces in the downtown of San Carlos had a tremendous impact on the, uh, you know, the actual flow of cars to parking spaces because a lot of people like those of us in the room spend a lot of time wandering around with our cars looking for parking spaces. So number one leader has to be the infrastructure owner and operator. The problem is many of them, frankly, are old line companies like the utilities. They think in 10 to 20 year capital budget constructs and not about innovating quickly and adapting quickly to emerging technology. Um, I say that with one fact in mind, a lot of them are our customers. So we're pushing very hard for the infrastructure owners. So the good news is, you know, in Detroit, for instance, the primary energy utility, in fact, the sole energy utility, DTE, Detroit Energy, Detroit, Detroit Edison, is very quickly adapting, and they're a real leader in this area. And during the Meeting of the Minds program in the fall on September 30th, October 1, October 2 in Detroit, they're going to be showing off about a dozen demonstration projects that they're doing uh, timed to show off during the Meeting of the Minds because they're looking at how can they accelerate the adoption. So one quick answer to your question is there are lots of different actors and they're all at different stages. The most critical, the most important is going to be the owner of the infrastructure. That's a quick answer. Do we have another question from the audience? Right there. I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about retrofits and how much of what you've talked about um, is able to be implemented after something is built and how much of it. Sorry, it's, it's all garbled. I can't hear any of the question for some reason. Okay, um, why don't I repeat it? Uh, the question is around uh, retrofits versus new construction or new new projects and um, that could pertain to both uh, buildings of course but also neighborhoods and, and cities uh, so the advantages and disadvantages of what you've been speaking about with respect to retrofitting existing buildings and cities versus developing new buildings and cities 
Sure, that's a great question. So we think that really the the essential business opportunity and and the policy challenges are going to be in retrofits uh, because most of the buildings in the world that we're going to have in 50 years have already been built and not a lot of new cities. Now, China is an exception, of course, and other parts of Asia may be an exception. And so we're involved in places like Songdo, in Greenfield, and New Build. But uh, we, we really do believe that the big mega opportunity for us, representing billions of dollars of revenue, but for the world in terms of things that we need to achieve, like dramatic improvements in energy efficiency, is going to be in the retrofits. So all of the technologies that I talked about with you are readily available for a retrofit as much as for a new build. And we, we, we take that as kind of a fundamental principle that has to be built into every new technology innovation that we focus on, uh, whether we build it or acquire it, and also our partners, because we know our partners have to be focused on the big opportunity, and this is certainly one of them. And retrofit has got to be number one. That's great, Gordon. Uh, I'm going to ask for the next question, then I'll repeat it back to you. Technology. How? What are the ways that you're thinking about using that towards um, combating crime, violence, and public safety um, in inner-city neighborhoods? Uh, so, Gordon, uh, this is actually a really interesting question. The, the the example that you gave with respect to the parking lot management. Um, that is, of course, is just one example of an urban system or an urban issue. Using that same strategy, that could be deployed for any number of other issues in the city. Uh, if you could just reflect on how that might be used in a, in a social context with respect to urban crime or maybe education. I mean, so many other uh, facets of cities that that strategy might be applied to. Yes, so let's take lighting. You know, you, lighting is ubiquitous in a urban environment, uh, except of course where systems have broken down like Detroit, where as much as 70% of the public outdoor lighting is not functioning. Um, and hopefully when they get out of bankruptcy, you know, that, that situation can change. But what we're doing with Philips Lighting, a key partner of ours in our lighting ecosystem, uh, but we're also doing it with some of their competitors like Lutron, is creating lighting which is intelligent, which means it can be manipulated remotely, it can be monitored remotely. Um, we can know when that lighting has dimmed uh, and it shouldn't be dimmed, or to reduce crime, we could increase the intensity of the lighting or change the color uh, or change the way that the lighting talks to the network. Uh, so there are a thousand new solutions that uh, the LED inventors and developers at Philips are creating uh, to promote a healthy workplace, to change the safety and security situation on a street corner. And they've got studies which are pretty dramatic uh, to show what happens. And they've done this in their home base in the Netherlands quite a lot because they use their home environment as a test bed. Um, and we deployed this in a, in a number of places. Detroit will be one of the early adopters of this kind of innovation around lighting which is intelligent, which has sensors built into the lighting. And by the way, on the light pole, it's not just a light now, it's a Wi-Fi connection and a, and a variety of other tools and assets that are built onto what now becomes not just a light pole, but a utility pole. And we expect cities like Detroit, when they come out of bankruptcy, to start not just replacing old incandescent bulbs with new incandescent bulbs, but moving to the intelligent LED solution that allows a lot of this uh, programmability. I can program on the fly and transmit that instruction to the light to dim, to change color, to flash uh, in an emergency, to flash in certain ways that will direct people away from an emergency, all those kinds of things that now are possible. Lighting is going to be, we think, next to smart parking, smart lighting will be a low-hanging fruit for a lot of cities to focus on. I'm from, my name is Monique, I'm from Maine, and in counties like Presque Isle, we lose energy quite easily, and wireless connections go out for weeks on end, and how do we combat, like, as weather changes and we have outages, how do you combat this idea of, like, a city functioning 
with all of these new technologies in the face of those conditions. News asking the question is from the state of Maine. I'm not sure if you've ever been to the state of Maine, um, but I think uh, part of the question is around uh, the intensity. When we think of cities and certainly think of mega cities, we can think of a certain density of urban infrastructure. Um, but the question is really around systems and how systems sometimes don't function to their um, intended uh, level of performance. Um, with power uh, networks sometimes going down related to storm events. Um, sometimes uh, there are certainly um, digital divide issues related to uh, geography of urban rural uh, splits. Um, if you could reflect on um, the future scenarios where the systems don't function in the manner in which they were optimally intended to. Sure. Well, you know, the, the origins of the internet um, were built around this question. And so when, when Cisco was born almost 30 years ago, it was born because the federal government funded a program which was designed to address this problem for the communications infrastructure of the United States. And the question that DARPA was asking is how to create a robust and resilient communication system that could survive a nuclear attack. Uh, which seems to us, you know, to be not so relevant. Although maybe with the processes underway. All right, can you can you hear me hear me again? Good. All right, we're back. So um, so we had a system failure because that was designed as a demonstration project for this question. By the way, um, now you get my point. So so we have, you know, in the early 1960s uh, to, to to middle late 1960s, you know, a big uh, problem that the federal government was trying to solve, and um, our two co-founders uh, were facing a similar challenge, which is there were a bunch of, of internet-type systems that had been set up, but there was no common protocol. So they were all different protocols, and uh, the first Cisco device was a multi-protocol device that allowed for two different systems that didn't have the common language to talk to each other because actually the husband and the wife, who were the co-founders, were on the Stanford University campus. And one was in a system with one protocol and the other was in a system with another protocol. But they actually had to communicate with each other regularly about who would get dinner together, who would leave work and pick up the kids, and who was going to walk the dog. And so lo and behold, you know, a system was not functioning well. So this was not a nuclear attack, but ultimately, the, 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 the defining characteristic of the internet was it never goes down because of the way it was designed. Um, from the outset, it was designed to be very robust and resilient with no center. There are multiple, multiple centers, and this highly decentralized, highly distributed capacity that was fundamental to the architecture is what's going to happen with the next generation of electrical grid uh, which is what we're working with companies like ITRON to enable the smart grid. We can talk about, you know, all the pros and cons of smart grid investment. But essentially the idea is 99.999 uptime. And we actually find legal contracts that say we guarantee you know, that level of service. The service level agreements that we sign have six or seven nines attached to them, sometimes only five nines. Uh, but the bottom line is that we can we can now guarantee all of that uptime and all of that uninterrupted service, but we can't guarantee the uninterrupted power supply. And so we are increasingly pushing our customers to distributed generation so that they're no longer dependent on the grid. This is not very popular with our utility customers who don't like to have competitors with solar panels on their rooftop or with wind on the, on the mountaintop uh, or with biomass or other types of solutions that are off grid. But we think the future is going to be highly decentralized generation of energy and highly decentralized processing of data. We think the big data center era is going to come to an end, and there's going to be a distributed and analysis and collection of data at the edge of the network where people live, rather than in the center where the big data centers are located with guys in white suits who generally have white hair. 
So this is the future that we see. And it, by the way, the technology now enables this. So the good news for rural Maine is that technology enables, and I would encourage you to look at today's Wall Street Journal, a project that we did in Antarctica, where, by the way, you can get, um, uh, I'm sorry, in the Arctic, you can, you can get the um, fastest internet speeds in the world in the most remote location in the world in the Arctic. And that's because what we have together built with our partners is just absolutely amazing. And amazing is really the, the best word to describe this. And I'd encourage you to look at that front page Wall Street Journal story today for the story of how we put together the world's fastest internet speeds for the residents who are the most remote rural residents anywhere in the world. So it's a good question and it's something we're really thinking about. Uh, Gordon, two, two additional quick questions and then we're gonna let you go here. Um, my question is basically just about affordability of the smart homes. Uh, how soon was the time frame? He might have already covered it, I might have missed it, but when that becomes commonplace, like a cell phone or a touch pad, you know, where every household has it, uh, and it's affordable for the regular person, not just, you know, a special project or the uber rich to have that technology in their home. The question is really around uh, social equity and access to technology. And um, the concern is, of course, around uh, certain segments of society being able to afford technology uh, and others not. And what are the kind of urban and community implications of that? If you could reflect on, on that. This is a big theme for us. It's a big theme for me. It's what we spend a lot of our time as a sponsor of Meeting of the Minds focused on this. And I would encourage uh, the questioner and anybody else to look at the blog site that we help to sponsor at City Minded, one word, C-I-T-Y-M-I-N-D-E-D.org, because at that blog site, practically every day, there's a guest blogger that's been invited to debate this, this, debate this very topic. And on, I think that's on May 12, we're gonna have a group blogging event on this subject with exactly this question at the forefront, how to deliver these kinds of benefits and value to the underserved populations who are often in disenfranchised neighborhoods that are not well served by high speed internet, wired or wireless, and who have been left on the edges uh, and in and behind in the race the race for uh, connectivity. So we're working with a lot of our biggest customers like Comcast and Time Warner Cable, who may become one company, and Verizon, Fios, and AT and T Uverse, and others who are doing you know, community wiring, both wired and wireless. We're working with them to really help them identify ways that they can address this, not just with lower cost solutions, but with policies that they're willing to promote that will make it obligatory for the service provider to have universal coverage and not just spotty coverage where people who have means can afford it. We do this, by the way, with dial tone. So the FCC requires dial tone access to everybody anywhere, anytime. We can do the same thing with broadband, high-speed internet connectivity. By the way, the, the South Koreans do this in every rural hamlet in South Korea. You have very, very high-speed wired and wireless both. And they invested tens of billions of dollars in national treasure to accomplish that. And there's no reason in the world why we can't do the same. You know, and we're we're pushing the FCC and we're pushing the big service providers. Of course, we have a a vested interest since every time it's deployed into a neighborhood that is underserved, we hope it you know, has a Cisco powered dimension to it. But even if not, we still want that because we think more, more in this domain is a lot better than less. So we have a bunch of initiatives as a company, including something called the Network Academy, and that's funded by Cisco Foundation. But we don't just keep it on the side as a, as a nice philanthropic activity. We've actually pulled it into the center of our business with our largest customers, as I was saying. So uh, this is not something that's going to get solved quickly unless there's major national investment by both the private sector and the public sector. We have some plans that we've proposed to do that quickly because time is of the essence. When you're leaving people behind, you know, it's a very slippery slope. You get farther and farther behind, it becomes that much more difficult to catch up. We don't want that. We want everybody to have equal access to a fundamental utility. If you can't get access to electricity, or gas or water, those three utilities, um, and 
most people can. We think the fourth utility, the world that I'm focused on, is just as fundamental as gas and water and electric. So thanks for the question. Uh, Gordon, I'm going to just uh, leave you with one last question. <clears throat> um, there is, of course, lots of uh, discussion and, and even literature now uh, talking about how um, uh, across the demographic uh, spectrum of our society, um, uh, the millennials have, have a, a rate of technology adoption that, that is far greater than, than other segments of, of, of our society. Um, but uh, we're here at Georgetown, and um, uh, you're speaking to a room full of, of future urban leaders. Um, much of what you've presented to us today, in aggregate, is, is really overwhelming with respect to what the future of communities uh, might be. Uh, could, you, could you leave us with a couple of thoughts about preparing oneself for shaping the communities of tomorrow? What, what should this next generation of urban leaders uh, be doing now to prepare themselves uh, for this really incredibly dynamic future that you, you've, you've framed out for us? Well, maybe to start with, I would advise millennials to not compromise with their parental units and the folks who are of that ilk, ilk and age and generation. Um, the, reality, the reality is that when the millennials tell their parents not to use email, but to text them. And then they keep insisting parents finally get it after the umpteenth demand is made that email is not an efficient way to communicate with me, mom. You should try this texting thing because SMS is pretty powerful. So making the demand and then making the demand and then making the demand that the organizations millennials work with or work for or are served by have to adapt themselves and have to grow up and become digitally intelligent. They may not be digital natives at my age, but we are adaptive when we are forced to be adaptive. And so I, you know, I would say, number one, no compromising. Number two is make the rules. Just don't remake the rules, but change the game. So the old rules don't work, and new rules in an old game are not as good as a new game. And my suggestion is whether it's in the context of an employment relationship or a friendship or a government service relationship between citizen and government or any number of others, use, use that guideline and not just play by the rules, which is not tolerable, and not just change the rules, which is a big pain to do, but to go for the big prize uh, which is change the game. So those would be my two biggest suggestions. They're obviously very vague in general, uh, but there are detailed kinds of implications for each of them. Um, I think, you know, millennials, because they're digital natives, they're the natural leaders in this process, and they're going to show us the way. So we, we better, the old folks, better listen carefully because we, you know, we, we, we do not listen, and then it's at our own peril that we don't listen. So please speak loudly when the millennials are speaking and listen up carefully because they've got something, even if they can't articulate it thoroughly, the digital natives know what they're talking about because it's living and breathing in their bones every day, the digital environment, not just being playful about it, but it's fundamental like oxygen. There are only two states of being in the millennial generation. You're either asleep or you're on the internet. So on that note, I'll say thanks to everybody. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your service and being an advisor to the program. Uh, thank you for your uh, insights today. Uh, we look forward to future engagement with you and with Cisco. Thank you. Thanks again, everybody. Have a good night there. Thank you. Bye-bye.